Hello everyone and welcome to The Wild Side. That was Mumford and Sons with Winter Winds and I'm your host Caitlin Kite and this week I am going to be talking a little bit about some of the most recent science news and if you've listened before then you know that I do this every now and then to kind of give you a rundown of the things that have happened, the newest developments and over the last week or so there have been some really interesting uh, announcements by researchers, some really cool papers that have come out talking about a lot of interesting new developments, particularly in the world of animal behavior, and I'm very interested in animal behavior, so I thought this would be kind of a fun opportunity to talk about some of those most recent results. And the first one, uh, which is what inspired me to select the song Winter Winds, is that uh, there's been some news out of Antarctica suggesting that humpback whales actually sometimes overwinter in Antarctica. Antarctica, which as you can imagine is quite a cold area that time of year, so this is quite a surprising discovery that scientists have made. And uh, the reason that they found this out, the way that they found this out, is that they collected some underwater recordings that uh, were being recorded by the Antarctic Acoustic Observatory. And they have a whole bunch of things that are submerged in the water that are able to collect these recordings from around the ocean, and then they can analyze these whenever they have the chance. And one of the researchers at the observatory walked in one morning to work, and as she always does, she switched on the feed. And as she was listening to the live feed, she actually could hear humpbacks calling in the background. And she was really surprised because at that time of year, they were supposed to be gone. Um, basically, all humpbacks were previously thought to migrate to the equator uh, near Africa and spend their winters there, eating in the warm waters and um, getting up to some activity preparing them for the breeding season. So it was really surprising to see these animals in a place where they'd never, well, to hear them, in a place where they'd never been before, and that was actually thousands of miles from where they were thought to be at that time. And what's interesting is that when humpbacks are in the Antarctic during the Antarctic summer, they're usually found feeding on krill in kind of ice-free areas that are located at about 60 degrees south. So that's pretty far south if you know your geography, but the ones that were heard um, during the winter were actually even farther south than that. They were at about 70 degrees. And this suggests that um, actually there's a whole lot we don't know about these whales at all. They, they were never known to have gone that far in the past, and this suggests that actually there could be other breeding grounds, uh, not just feeding grounds, that we weren't even aware of in the past. And hearing these recordings uh, and that one instance inspired the researchers to go back through their previous recordings and see if there were some other instances of whale vocalizations that they could find and then um, try to get some more information about, you know, how often is this happening, exactly what time of the year, do we see them throughout the entire winter or just a part of it, that sort of thing. So they built um, kind of a computer program that was able to sift through all these massive collections of recordings and extract the little bits that sounded like whale calls, and they were then able to listen to those and confirm that they were whale calls and then make some analysis of these uh, recordings. And this revealed that indeed whales were overwintering in the region, so um, the data set that was being reported on in this particular paper that just came out was focusing on the years of 2008 and 2009 in particular, and I'm sure that they have been um, extending that research and they've been doing it since then, but that so we know that at least in those two years, and probably in other years as well, the whales were in Antarctica during the winter. And what we still don't know is what exactly are the whales communicating, um, what kind of messages are they sending out, or what's the motivation for um, making noise at all, which are the animals that are making the calls. So unfortunately, the researchers aren't able to put I identifying um, labels on each of these so they can say, well, this is that same uh, individual making another call yet again. It just sounds like a whole bunch of calls that could be one individual making lots of vocalizations or lots of different individuals talking back and forth, and that's, that can't be told just yet. It's also not clear what larger population these animals belong to. They could belong all to the same population or they could be from different populations, and of course whales are migratory so they can spend the rest of their year at, at, in varying other places and then they kind of aggregate down in the Antarctic and then disperse again. So it's really interesting to know about this because it, you could kind of understand a little bit more about the dynamics of migration and also the dynamics of the gene flow uh, because once these whales do 
intermingle, they are likely to, to breed with each other and pass on genes that way. So this does have some actual implications because it could be really meaningful for conservationists to know how much gene flow there is and where these animals are coming from and what routes they're using to get to the Antarctic for the breeding season. And one of the ways that they can actually extract that information from these recordings of whale calls is that they can compare dialects. And if you've listened to the show before, then maybe you've heard me talk about um, bird song and the fact that birds and other animals do often have dialects that indicate where they're from. They have dialects just like we do, because when you are in a given region and you're kind of sequestered from other animals, then you do tend to kind of sound alike and you develop certain little characteristics that help researchers distinguish your vocalizations from those of animals that are from another population. So they will be able to do this most likely with the whales and try to understand where it is they've come from. And not only can they distinguish uh, between the dialects within the recordings they've collected in Antarctica, but they can also then appeal to their colleagues at other institutions who also have collections of recordings so that they can compare the Antarctic recordings to those that are from other parts of the world. And hopefully that will enable them to then figure out where these whales have come from and maybe even begin to um, potentially say, hey, this is, this is the same vocalization exactly that we heard in the Antarctic, so that might even be the very same individual and not just from the same population. So there's some really exciting new research that this completely opens up that people hadn't even dreamed of in the past. Now, another kind of interesting aspect of the story is that the presence and absence of whales is probably associated with the fact that these open water areas that they feed called um, pollinias, they are affected by prevailing winds. So these are areas that are kind of open bits of the sea ice where the whales can actually surface and move around and get krill. So obviously the krill are going to be um, in the water no matter what, but the whales need a bit that's open so they can surface in order to get air every now and then. So they can only feed in areas as long as these things are open. And because the winds will change whether the ice is open or not and where it's open, it may be the case that the whales actually have always stayed around in the Antarctic and they just follow where those little open bits are. And they've never been in this region in particular before um, because maybe it just wasn't ever open, but now it's recently been open, which has allowed them to utilize this habitat. And all this is the kind of thing that the scientists will want to look at in more detail in order to understand how long this behavior has been going on and what is facilitating it. Now, one of the reasons that they think the whales might want to stay around, even though it is quite cold, is that the trip that they make to Africa, uh, the, the migratory trip that they take, is actually quite energetically costly. They have to put on a lot of weight, just like all migrating animals do, put on a lot of fat that they can then use to power their trip all the way across the ocean. So if they can just not have to worry about expending all of that energy on movement, if they can just hang around and literally chill out over the winter, and then it actually is, is really nice for them because they haven't had to expend any energy, they haven't had to expose themselves to anything dangerous like um, shipping, uh, like l really large ships that might encounter them out there and potentially damage them. They haven't had to worry about getting back to the breeding grounds in time to get uh, food and to get mates and to get space and all that kind of thing. They can, they're just there all along. They have access to what they need and they never have to worry about anything else. So it makes a lot of sense, particularly if you are a breeding female, because for the females this can be really hard because they need to put so much energy into breeding their calves. So if they're able to reserve that energy from the trip and instead put it into the reproductive effort, then obviously that would be kind of a no-brainer. And of course you'd want to stick around as long as you could. So all of this finally uh, emphasizes the importance of this area, the Southern Ocean, as humpback whale habitat. And before it was known that it was used as habitat for feeding purposes, and now we know also that it's important for uh, breeding purposes. And the announcement of this particular finding actually comes really close uh, in time to an announcement about protecting, or in this case actually not protecting, portions of the Antarctic. So it's really good evidence that actually, even though we've um, had some, some government bodies recently decide not to protect as much of the Antarctic as previously proposed, uh, this research suggests that maybe we do need to do that if we want to protect these whale populations that we're um, working so hard to, to keep safe and healthy. All right, so the next 
uh, bit of news that I want to address is also something that has to do with the water. Uh, and this is kind of a fun story out of Hawaii. And basically, the punchline of, of the story is that there is traditional Hawaiian folk wisdom about sharks and about when you're likely to get shark bites. And there have been some recent discoveries that suggest that actually this folk wisdom isn't just one of those little old wives tales uh, that has no basis in reality, that actually it may be rooted in biological fact. And I always think this kind of thing is really interesting because there are a lot of really old sayings and old practices that we might look at now and think are a bit weird, but actually the reason that these things came into being and have hung around so long is that there is some real wisdom behind them and some real um, logic, and, and this is a, apparently a really good case of that. So evidently in Hawaii there are some traditional stories suggesting that shark bites are more common during the late summer and also in fall, so kind of in the September to November uh, range of times. And this is also the time when the willy willy tree blooms. So the, the traditional story would go that when the willy willy is in bloom, you need to watch out for shark bites. And records uh, show actually that shark bites in general are quite rare. So they're only about two to four in Hawaiian waters each year, at least in modern times. But um, shark activity does peak at this time. So I, I just I want to emphasize the thing about shark bites because people do tend to get really nervous about sharks when actually statistically it's quite unlikely you'll ever get bitten. But that is in modern times when we may have fewer sharks, when we also have much more advanced kind of um, nautical gear and things like that. So potentially in the past bites were much more common. But the important thing is that actually it is true that regardless of whether you're looking at bites or mere likelihood of bite, uh, there is quite a lot of shark activity in the islands at exactly the same time that the, the traditional stories were talking about. And the way that researchers uncovered this was that they tagged approximately a hundred or so different tiger sharks. And most of these tiger sharks were females because they were interested in studying uh, tiger shark breeding. And these animals were watched over a seven year period. And they found that approximately a quarter of the females returned to the island each year and some of the animals arrive and then and go again and then come back and it's kind of a cyclical process and others arrive and hang around uh, throughout the winter and, and the different seasons and spend their time in Hawaii there. Um, but either way, you've got all this shark activity that seems to be really peaking during this time uh, that's the focal period of that Hawaiian saying. And the way they were able to track all these sharks was that the, um, they were tagged with uh, the, the sharks were tagged themselves and then there were receivers in the area, in the Hawaiian waters, that were able to register the presence or, and I guess you could say also the absence of these tags. So whenever a shark swims past, you can see that the, the tag is there, you can tell which shark it is, and you can also get some basic information, you know, maybe about its speed or the time of day or kind of, you know, statistics like that to help you figure out something about its movement. And then as soon as the animals leave the area, you know that they're gone, but then once they come back again, uh, you detect them once again. So you can see this motion of their migration and their return. And researchers previously didn't know much of anything about what the tiger sharks were doing. Uh, and this particular study has helped them not only find out when the animals are descending upon Hawaii and how many of them are staying there all the time, but also to get kind of an idea of of how far away these animals go. So for example, one of them was eventually caught off the coast of Mexico. And uh, even though they aren't able to detect the animals there using those little uh, devices underwater, they are able to have fishermen report back to them when they find these animals. And that's what happened here. So there was a fisherman that called up the number on the tag and reported the return of, of this shark. And the fact that you've got a shark showing up in Mexico all the way from Hawaii suggests that these animals can roam really far and wide, which is quite interesting. And despite how far away they go, they often, again, are choosing to go back to Hawaii. And it seems that they're doing this because um, they want to breed. And they like to have their pups, if you want to call them that, in the Hawaiian waters. So it looks like when these sharks are coming back to Hawaii during that kind of autumnal period, it's when they are producing their young, and they want their young to probably be able to take advantage of uh, the bounty that's there in the Hawaiian waters. And the researchers say this has all been really exciting and really interesting, but actually it raises a bunch of questions, uh, like why you have some animals that are staying all the time, why you have some that go and come back, 
Uh, and some of that is quite common in the animal kingdom, but it's nice to know exactly why for sharks are they choosing to do these different things. Because, um, again, they don't really think this is going to be any kind of a, a problem for humans, uh, and thinking that humans might get hurt by these animals. But it is quite interesting if you want to figure out where you need to protect these animals, or how exposed they're going to be, or evolutionarily why might they choose to make these different decisions. So it is quite a discovery to find um, the, the cyclic nature of these movements and the predictability of when they're going to show up each year. That was Charlie Feathers with That Certain Female, and you may recognize that song from the Kill Bill soundtrack. And today on Wild Sci, we are talking about some of the latest science news, and actually, just completely by accident, the next couple of stories I want to talk about are also marine-oriented, uh, so I do have a bit of a theme emerging here. However, this, this next one is quite different from sharks and whales, uh, so the story this time is that there is a species of endangered limpet that can change sex multiple times within a lifetime. And the particular species being studied here was an endangered species known as Patella uh, ferruginia, or ferruginia, who knows how to say these Latin names. Um, but this guy is particularly interesting because in order to study it, the researchers had to develop a brand new technique. Um, so for a long time, researchers have known that limpets were able to change their sex in order to improve reproductive success. But they've not, or at least they've suspected that, but they haven't really been able to study it very well because in order to actually look at the gonads of these individuals and confirm that they have changed sex from you know, point A to point B, they have to basically end up killing the animal. And what normally happens is that you've got... Um, males, so all these will start out as males and then eventually become female when they're large enough because when you are a large female you tend to have the best reproductive success possible and smaller females don't have reproductive success that's quite as high. So it's quite advantageous to you to change your sex at some point when you are large enough so you reproduce as a male when you're smaller and younger and then when you're old enough and big enough you become a female and then can improve your breeding success that way by breeding as a female. And this is quite a logical thing to do and there's a lot of evidence that this is what animals have been doing so with limpets they would look uh, they would conduct surveys where they'd actually harvest the animals, and what they found was a lot of small limpets that were female, uh, sorry, that were males, a lot of big limpets that were females, and then kind of some intermediate limpets that were of both sexes, not simultaneously, but of, of each of the two sexes. And this suggested that those intermediates were ones where the males hadn't yet changed over into females, and the females had just been males and had just changed over. Uh, but no one could really study this because, as I said, if you actually want to look at a limpet and say, right, this little one is a male, and then come back in a couple years and say, now that he's big again, let's sample again, and then find out that he's a female, actually, uh, you can't do that because you would have to harvest the entire gonad, and that would kill off the animal. But these researchers from Spain were able to come up with a whole new technique where they would take a hypodermic needle and insert it through the tissues in order to perform a biopsy of the gonad. And this could reveal that an animal would start off as a female, and then they could, um, the animals would then survive, and they could re be retested later on so that the researchers could then see if they were actually then turning into females over time. And in fact, they did find this, but the interesting thing is that they also found the animals were switching from female back to male, and that the changes can actually be made several times within a lifetime. So you don't just have that unidirectional change where as soon as you're big enough and can be a successful uh, female breeder, then you change over to females. They also found that even when females were large and, and in the position to be successful, they could switch back into males and then do that all over again. And probably the reason that they do this is that uh, they're taking advantage of, of particular conditions. So maybe for some reason or another the sex ratios in the environment are altered and they aren't able to get enough mates of one sex or the other. If you've got animals that can then respond to that by changing sex, then they're going to ensure that they can keep on reproducing. And you could think that they would be able to sense this by having um, some sort of a, a chemical receptor that would indicate whether they're 
uh, are female products being produced or male products being produced or kind of get an idea of the ratio of, of female and male um, what sexual you know the, the gene output from both of these individuals or whatever these things are producing there would be some way of gauging that from the environment and then using that to inform your decision uh, about what sex you'll be it might also mean that if you've got females that are kind of still on the smallish side uh, that if they are able to realize this in some way that they could then revert back to males because that would be a state where they would actually have better success as breeders so again, maybe somehow they're able to detect that they aren't producing enough eggs or they aren't uh, somehow producing enough young. Maybe they can sense this genetically by their neighbors. Who knows? But if they can somehow have some sort of an awareness that allows them to switch back into another form, this again could help them maximize their reproductive success and also help keep the population nice and healthy. Now another interesting thing that uh, I read about not written by the actual scientists who did this research, but by someone else who was covering the story, was that limpets can also uh, potentially be influenced by the environment. And we, we don't know whether this is actually the case in this endangered species, though the fact that they are endangered makes this a particularly interesting idea. Um, but we do know that there are other gastropods, um, and pr probably other marine species in general, not just of that one group, that can be influenced by toxic compounds that are in the water and the soil. And these compounds can influence uh, the sex that they are. And we already know, I've, I've spoken recently, I think, about how there are some fish that have been found to um, be both sexes at the same time or, or end up being you know, one sex in one area of the body and another sex in another area of the body, or kind of weird things like that that prevent them from reproducing very successfully. So this is the kind of thing that, that we see happening because of chemicals that are produced by humans. So for example, the anti-fouling agent uh, tributyl-10 can cause something that's called imposex. And imposex is the development of male gonads in female gastropods. And this was a particular problem in dog whelks and caused governments uh, here in UK and France and probably also beyond to ban the use of these compounds and to come up with other things instead. And the government, of course, recognizes that anti-fouling agents are really important because it can prevent uh, unnecessary expenditure of money and can prevent people from using too much gasoline uh, or, sorry, petrol when they're driving around. But it also is really bad on the environment if you've got all these animals unable to reproduce and then dying off because these are important food organisms uh, and they have other impacts on the environment as well. So it is really important to think about whether these chemicals are causing changes in sex ratios and they're reducing reproductive success because that can still have huge impacts on these populations. And that's true even today, which is uh, 10, 20 years after these things have been outlawed because these chemicals can be deposited in sediments. And this is actually one of the worries of people who uh, oppose the dredging out here in Falmouth Bay is that whenever you bring up some of those sediments, uh, and while you're dredging, some of the chemicals like tributyl-10 and other anti-fouling agents are going to then be put into the water supply and it could cause problems with these organisms, um, just like we were seeing 10, 20 years ago when these things were first discovered to have these really negative effects. So now researchers are trying to find a lot of alternatives and try to figure out a way to clean these things from the environment so that we aren't uh, accidentally causing things like dog whelks and potentially these limpets to have uh, to suffer in terms of reproduction because we do want to keep these things nice and healthy. Now the next story also as I said in, in a marine environment and as it turns out also about mating success. So this one is, is quite a cool thing um, and I have talked about something kind of similar to this in the past but this is a brand new example of it and I actually give a lecture on a topic related to this, so I'm hoping I'll be able to work this example in at some point, because it is some really nice research. Uh, basically, scientists have found that there are some guppies, uh, actually quite a few species of guppies, that will lie about their um, mate choice in order to trick rivals. And this is something where you could have all sorts of human connotations if you want to get um, kind of anthropomorphic and think about this, because it is kind of a, a funny situation. But basically the idea is that uh, amongst these males, there's going to be really high competition for the best mates. Uh, so let's say that there's a male who figures out which female is most 
uh, most attractive or highest quality or, or whatever, uh, using whatever means these guppies use. And in this case, it could be size, it could be their coloration, it could be something about how they act. There are lots of different uh, traits that play into this. But let's just say basically a male has figured out which female is quite attractive and, and quite probably a good mate, and so he wants to go after her. Well, the problem with that is that other males will be looking at you. They'll all be looking at each other to figure out wh who these guys are choosing because they kind of think, well, you know, uh, if someone else thinks that female is attractive, then she probably is, and I'm going to use his expertise to inform my decision. And it's a really smart thing, and humans tend to do this as well. Lots of species do this. Uh, so it's called mate choice copying. And it's a really good way, if you're, maybe if you're young, you're inexperienced, you aren't very successful, it's a really good way of increasing your chances of actually choosing a good mate. So, first of all, you've got this male that, you know, doesn't want to have, he doesn't want to be followed around, he doesn't want other males encroaching on his female. Now this is particularly true because female guppies can store sperm from multiple males and use it when they're ready to produce their eggs. And during the storage period, the sperm will compete with each other. And some males are going to have more sperm, they're going to have better sperm, um, they're going to have certain things within their um, ejaculate that can kill off other sperm that can be toxic. So there are lots of reasons why you as a male don't want your sperm to be in the presence of another male's sperm. And this is particularly true because most of the time, um, the female uses the most recently injected sperm when she's fertilizing her eggs. So you don't want to be that guy that figures out who should be mated with and then mates with her right away and then has everyone else follow in your footsteps and mate with her as well and then have that last male take over your position and get his sperm into her eggs because that means you have absolutely no breeding success even though you've got really good choice in the ladies. So basically the idea with these uh, with these guppies is that it seemed likely that uh, males should want to eventually mate with their preferred ma uh, female but throw other males off the scent and they might be able to do this by instead choosing a lesser female or an uninteresting female and mating with her and therefore getting all the other males to go off and mate with her as well and then going off and kind of sneakily mating with the female that he actually wants to father young with and then hopefully do that so that uh, it's kind of a secretive thing and his sperm isn't out-competed within the female. So this was the big theory of these researchers and they collected 10 different species of guppy and they performed a bunch of experiments where they had males with females, sometimes in the presence of an audience, sometimes without the presence of an audience. And they were trying to figure out if having those other males around does increase the likelihood that the focal males are going to kind of pretend about which female they want in order to throw these other guys off the track. And sure enough, they did find that um, basically this, this seems to be what's happening. So there, there does seem to be less preference expression in species that have more of a sperm competition risk. So like I said, they had 10 different species that they studied. And in 9 out of 10 of these species, they did find that males were less likely to strongly indicate which female that they wanted. And this um, it's just a correlation, but it could, could very likely be because the males are trying not to let those other males see which females they're actually interested in. And instead, they're trying to be more misleading. And again, they also found that in species that did have this kind of misleading behavior where the males would show interest in a female that was probably not as, as attractive, um, that there was more mean sexual activity. So that these guys were actually ultimately getting more sex than the other, um, the other situations. So this does seem to, this misleading behavior, this lying, does seem to increase the likelihood that you are able to copulate with, um, with females and that you're copulating not just with the attractive female that you want, but also that unattractive female that you're using as kind of a red herring, so to speak. I guess that's a really strange metaphor when I'm already talking about guppies, but you get the idea. So another alternate suggestion in this scenario is that perhaps the males are, it has, has nothing to do with female preference, but actually they're just trying to avoid fights with the male in the audience. So maybe, uh, you know, you've got a male that feels like he's potentially a bit scrawny, he's not going to be very good in a fight, he's a bit worried about things, and so rather than go for that really hot female across the room, he just selects the kind of puny female that's more, more in his ballpark, 
because he thinks that that will then help him avoid a conflict with that other male in the area. So this seems like a really good idea as well, uh, potentially just as likely as the other scenario. But the researchers found actually um, this wasn't suggested by their results, that they found that the, the males who were engaging in more sexual activity and doing all this preference um, kind of behavior that, that I mentioned before, that they actually had more sexual activity and also more aggressiveness. So these guys that were mating with both the, the poor quality and the good quality females, these misleading Casanovas, uh, they were not the puny males. They were not shying away from a fight. They actually were more likely to be a fighter. Uh, and this suggests that actually there's a hormonal link. So we all know that a lot of aggressiveness has to do with hormones, that you've got this kind of male hormones raging and causing this kind of antagonistic behavior. So this suggests that both sexual activity and aggressiveness are being tied together by these hormone links and that that could drive this particular behavior. So it's actually the more kind of manly fish, if you like, that show both of these things simultaneously and that helps them to be successful. And this kind of correlation between these two traits can also be referred to as a behavioral syndrome or a personality, if you like. And these authors of this paper have suggested that this particular personality, this kind of lying personality might have evolved because uh, all those pressures placed by sperm competition risk forced these fish to find a way to um, be able to mate with the females that they want without having their um, without having their sperm outcompeted within the females and so they've come a lot, come up with this kind of um, beating around the bush sort of way of, of finally getting in with the female that they like while also avoiding competition from other males. And that was Leanne Womack with Liar's Lie. And that is from the Country Strong soundtrack. I'm kind of on a soundtrack roll today, aren't I? All right, so today we are talking about some recent science stories. And the next one I want to share with you is uh, another really interesting thing, again, about mate choice, actually. Um, because researchers in the US have found that a little species of sparrow called the dark-eyed junco uses scent when it chooses its mate. And the reason that this is so interesting and exciting is that um, researchers have thought for a really long time that birds rely predominantly on visual and acoustic signals and cues when they're choosing their mates, and also just basically doing any form of communication. Uh, so there are lots of other animals, as you know, that use scent to broadcast important messages. Uh, you know, wolves and dogs peeing on bushes is a great example. Uh, I've talked about others in the past as well, so things like hippos and rhinos that will kind of use their poo to, to communicate their presence and also kind of their uh, toughness to other individuals. So there are lots of different ways in which other animals, and particularly mammals and insects, will do this. But uh, typically birds have not thought to rely very much on smell. And this is something that I actually find really interesting because when I was an undergrad, my advisor was really into this issue and she used to go up into the Arctic and study little auklets that live there and um, she knew very few other people who were interested in the sorts of questions that she was which was how these birds might be using scent in order to communicate with each other and um, choose mates and do all sorts of things. And so at the time when I was an undergrad this was still something that was just not studied all that much. It was not really thought to happen all that much and over the years I've not seen too many developments in this particular field. But just this week, this really cool study came out, and basically what it found is that the birds seem to be perfuming themselves using oil from their preen glands. So you have probably seen birds preening before, and what they do is they will uh, kind of tuck themselves backwards, tuck their nose under their tail, and rub oil from the preen gland on their bill, and then spread that oil through their wings. And this keeps their wings in good shape so that they can fly and they can swim and they're strong. Um, sometimes birds will have a little bit of waterproofing in, in that gland, um, in, in the oil from that gland, which helps them then uh, shed the, the water off of their feathers when they go underneath. Um, so this is really an important thing for them, but why not also use that preen oil for something else? So I've mentioned in the past that there are flamingos that have coloration in their preen oil that they use to color themselves up to look pretty. Uh, to make themselves pinker so that the males 
uh, and females will, will find each other more attractive. And this seems to be another example of where that preen oil can contain something else that is not just for the feathers, but also is sending a message. And, and, and again, it's useful for reproduction. And the reason that this seems to work is that the preen oil contains volatile compounds. And those are compounds that uh, break down really quickly, and so they're released into the air, and then we can um, breathe them in and, and smell them. And when I say we, I mean the other birds. I don't really know if humans can smell this, actually. That would be quite interesting to know. So the current study found that at the beginning of the breeding season, which is when you have a lot of mate choice activity going on, um, the, the smell of these birds, the intensity of the smell and the type of smell, is correlated with reproductive success over the entire season. And basically the idea is that the males that smell more masculine and the females that smell more feminine, and of course, the, they're determining this by looking at the chemical composition of these things. This is not just kind of a, um, a subjective thing. Uh, they are looking at the chemical composition and finding that the, the animals that smell more like their sex is supposed to smell have higher reproductive success. And there's also um, uh, quite a, an interesting relationship between odor and breeding relative to the relationship that we find between breeding and either size or plumage coloration. So previously we've thought that you know birds are looking for birds that are nice and big because those are the ones that will have the resources to produce good eggs. They'll be the ones that are good enough to go out and get food to, to feed to the young. We also tend to think that they want really bright birds because there's a lot of um, attractiveness that you can gauge, whether that's because they're able to go out and get the compounds that they need in their diet to make them brightly colored, or because they're able to be brightly colored and still avoid predation. Whatever the, the case is, these are things that have typically been associated with attractiveness in a mate and potentially then good reproductive success. And even though some of those relationships can be quite strong, it actually was stronger when you looked at the smell of an animal and its breeding success, which suggests that this is actually something that could be quite important for these birds. And what was another interesting aspect of this is that the females seem to be making multiple de different decisions based on scent. So they're not only looking at which mates do they want to copulate with and produce eggs with, but also which partners do they want to be with to raise their young. And social mates and sexual mates are not always one and the same, and that's particularly true in birds. And you'll often find female birds raising a brood with one male, but then actually going off and having kind of little sneaky sexual encounters with another male. And this helps her uh, maximize the genetic diversity of her young. And the researchers found that cuckolded males tend to have um, kind of less of that male scent and, and more of a feminine type of odor. So basically these were the males that were um, likely to be better fathers, but maybe not uh, the ones that the females wanted to get their genetic material from. And this is quite an interesting little tidbit given that um, also this week you may have heard the news that supposedly men with smaller testicles are better at being fathers. This is humans I'm talking about now. Um, and this has been all over the news, so I wouldn't be surprised if you have heard it, because it's quite a catchy story. So it is an interesting thing where maybe in multiple different species there is some kind of recognition that men that are kind of, uh, sorry, males that are hyper-masculine are good for one particular function, uh, especially relative to breeding, while males that are a bit less masculine and a bit more feminine can contribute something else. So this is maybe now kind of a multi-species pattern that is emerging here in the natural world. And just to take it back to this Junko story, this does suggest that odors are providing insights for birds, and we didn't think that this was something that was really possible. And this raises the question of how many other birds are also using scent in order to find things out about individuals and, and make decisions based on those things. And it could be that the scent is telling them not just about hormone levels, because I did say that was probably a mechanism here, but also other things like what's their condition, what's their overall health, what's their genetic background, because all of those things can go into determining how much or what type of hormone is being produced. So this is potentially quite a complex signal, and obviously there's a lot here uh, that can be researched in the future. So I think the last story that I have time for today, um, unless I happen to talk really fast, is another one in birds. And this is a study where researchers have found that Eurasian roller chicks, which you guys might have seen, 
because they do uh, show up here every now and then. These guys repurpose insect toxins for use in anti-predator behaviors. And this is another cool kind of story because it's another unique thing that people haven't really seen in the past. And it's amazing to think that there are still these brand new things that are found out in nature despite hundreds of years of study. So the, the idea here is that um, you've got adult rollers, so parental roller birds, that are going out and feeding their young insects that confer on the young um, some toxins that those animals are then able to kind of process into a form that they can use to defend themselves. And predominantly the, the insect of choice is grasshoppers, but there are also other things like centipedes uh, that many other birds in the same area will avoid. But it looks like the adult rollers are going out of their way to find these animals and feed them to their young. And this suggests that um, the birds are resistant to the toxic substances that these animals produce. They're obviously able to ingest them and then not die. And it looks like uh, part, this is just part of a kind of adaptation that allows them to do really well. So it's not only that they don't die when they eat these things, which then gives them a, a great food source, but also that they can repurpose those toxins and use them for themselves. Now the insects contain the toxins because they ingest them from plants, and the plants produce them because they want to have herbivores find them distasteful. So basically these toxins are just being passed right along the food chain until they get to the rollers. And the rollers will put them, uh, sequester a whole bunch of them into this pungent orange liquid that they produce and they then vomit up. And the vomit contains chemicals like uh, hydroxybenzoic and hydroxycinamic acid uh, and also phenolic acids and sorolin. So this stuff not only is it going to taste bad, but it's also going to smell really bad and be quite unappealing. And researchers have encountered this when studying the birds, and this is what really got them thinking about why this stuff is being produced. And basically what they found is that when the birds were actually picked up, they would vomit and produce this orange stuff. But when the birds were just approached or kind of gently prodded or talked to or whatever, they wouldn't. And so they thought maybe these toxins are specifically being used to target the predators that would come, pick up the birds, and then walk away with them to eat them. So things like uh, snakes, obviously they aren't walking, but you get the idea. Uh, rats, mustelids, things like that. Predators that would grasp them and probably work their way through each of the birds in the nest sequentially. And these are obviously going to be quite a dangerous thing because the nestlings are stuck there in the nest. They don't have any defense. So when you've got these other animals that are coming in and just raiding the nest, that usually wipes out an entire brood at once. So any defense that helps even one of the animals is going to increase the reproductive success of the parents and pass those genes along. So the researchers went and they collected a bunch of this vomit, which must have been a really fun thing to do, and they smeared it on a bunch of pieces of chicken. And they took the chicken and offered it to dogs, which I think is really cruel because who knows what this stuff could do to them. Um, but basically they only put it on one side of the chicken and then they put that smeared side down. So all the dogs could see was just a nice clean regular bit of chicken. And the dogs were offered a piece that was smeared with um, the toxin and a piece that was smeared with water only. So just kind of doing the mechanical procedure but not actually putting the chemicals on it. And what they found was that the majority of dogs avoided the treated meat whenever they went to pick up one piece or the other. So like something like 18 out of 20 of them went directly for the one that had not been treated with the vomit. And then a lot of them subsequently did eat the other piece as well, but there were six of them that completely left the treated meat alone. So first of all, there seems to be a, a hesitation involved when you're presented with this. There's something kind of unappealing about it and it makes you pause. And then secondly, uh, some animals will be completely scared off and not eat this stuff at all. So maybe then the researchers think that this uh, is something that maybe just makes the predators hesitate for long enough that the parents come in and can potentially defend their young, or maybe the predators will eat the first young and then find it really unappealing and then not eat the rest of the birds and the brood. And either way, you've potentially got some um, reproductive success there, some, some help with your reproductive success because it would reduce the amount of nestlings that are eaten or the amount of times that a predator can come in and eat those nestlings. And so ultimately it might end up allowing you to have more young at the end of the breeding season. 
And again, this is the kind of thing that needs to be investigated a bit more in the future, so maybe they can actually do some real experiments out in the wild with, um, with predators. Maybe they can take away the source of these toxins and then see if those broods get predated more often or something like that. But it is quite an interesting thing from the beginning, um, just thinking about what the researchers had found, which is that there are these toxins that the birds are using for their own advantage. And unfortunately, I do have a couple other stories that I'm just going to have to skip over for today because that is it for my time. Hopefully you enjoyed those little tidbits of science that have been coming out over the last week or two. Um, this morning I did update the Wildside webpage, so please do check that out if you want to find out about the songs I've been playing or some of the topics that I've been addressing. I will put uh, today's stuff up there as well. And that will include this final song, which is Yael Naim's Toxic. And this is a cover of a Britney Spears song. So I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show, and I will talk to you next week. <laughs>